Let me, okay, excellent. All right, so good to see you again, Tim. I want to give some background on exactly why this is happening. Um, we interviewed last month, um, and there was some kind of, you know, misunderstanding after that. But basically, I think what was the most important takeaway from all the dust up is that there were some really important questions that arose around um, allyship and conversations about how um, this process should look when we're engaging in, in the work of educating or activating for social justice. Mm -hmm. So um, I thought we had some really great conversations, actually more in our emails than in the interview itself. It, yeah. was, a soft, it was a softball interview. Yeah. Honestly, it was like a, this is cool, I'm talking to Tim Wise, I want to hear what he has to say, you know, um, and I feel like it was actually more substantive when we had the emails, so I wanted to kind of talk through some of that fact today. Right. Um, so, so, so first thing, let's talk about just kind of some narratives that um, were kind of the basis of my, uh, my critique. So let's start with, it came mainly from your books and from some of the like stuff I saw online, some of the conversations you had, which you also went through in the emails very thoroughly. But um, I want to begin with some of the narratives from, um, from your work. So uh, specifically, white like me. Um, okay. Central point there, whites are racist, and sometimes irrationally so. Um, racism harms people of color and white. Um, and I know that there's been a lot of contention about the notion that um, racism works both ways. Um, there's been conversations specifically that it's a white-centric perspective on racism, right? It's the, here's how it feels um, when you are white and you are a racist person. Or maybe you're not a racist person and you're experiencing racism at the hands of other whites. Navigating through those feelings and emotions and activating or alleviating those issues. Um, so specifically there, about that critique, about it being white-centric, have you have you spoken about um, about that kind of idea that that racism, discrimination, prejudice, the system of, of, of institutionalized racism can impact white people in terms of how that how that translates to people of color feeling marginalized or feeling like their voices are not as important? Well, I mean, yeah, are we talking about white like me now? The the book? We're talking about the the, the narrative, which is okay what was introduced in White Like Me. Right. Well, I mean, clearly, you know, the point of White Like Me was to discuss white privilege. It wasn't to discuss um, the broader, you know, universe of issues related to racism, but which, as a white person, um, I didn't think it was really my place to focus on. I, I sort of have always thought and been encouraged to think by activists and scholars of color that, as a white person in the work, um, the best thing that I could do, the most helpful thing that I could do in the larger struggle was to tell um, sort of, I don't know, insider secrets about what it means to be privileged, right? Like to tell, to tell the stuff that maybe people of color assume is happening and know is happening intuitively, right, but that they're not experiencing since they're not receiving those privileges. And so I took that advice very seriously and really, even when I was much younger, started sort of writing down stories and things that were happening and, and taking notes and keeping a journal. And finally, you know, by 2003 or four, decided to turn that into a book where I would really chronicle um, a couple of very specific themes about whiteness. One was to document the privilege that I'd experienced personally. So it's a memoir um, about my own experience with, with privilege. But I also wanted to have some other themes in there. I didn't want it to just be you know, a book-length version of Peggy McIntosh's Knapsack article, which is a fine article, but we don't need 400 pages of that. You know, we, we need more than that. So what I wanted to do was to, to also talk about how whites um, can resist uh, systems of privilege and, and what that looks like. So I had a section on that in the original version that was actually called Resistance had a section on collaboration because I wanted to make the point using my own personal examples of times that when I had tried to resist, I had screwed up and ended up collaborating with racism and even helping to perpetuate privilege and manifesting it. And I thought those were important stories to tell. Um, and I think they're important for any white person who's going to do the work. And then I had a section that in the original version was called loss. And that was looking at what some of the impacts, the harms of white privilege are even to white people. It was certainly not intended to 
displaced from the center from the center of the narrative, the injury done to people of color. And I made that very clear in both the first version, the second version, and the third version. But it is important, I think, and helpful for white people to think about how systems of inequality and oppression aimed at others, where they're not where we are not the targets, but we end up being sort of the collateral damage of that system. And I went through a number of ways why that was true in my estimation. Economic harms to inequality, even for most whites cultural loss, lots of things like that. So it, the idea was really to supplement the narratives that exist that people of color have been writing for a long time so that white folks would see that racism isn't just an issue that people of color need to think about. And it's not one that white folks should think about only in sort of a I don't know, paternalistic, charitable, oh, let me go help them kind of way, right? right. It's more about also figuring out what's in it for us to join that struggle. Right, and and and, and see, I, I understand that conversation. It's funny to me because um, I've been called noncommittal when it comes to this conversation about the role that white has in social justice and social activism. And I agree that I I personally believe that racism does work both ways. But I think the contention has been on such a prominent scale when I think people of color, in particular, who are doing this work, often feel marginalized or feel as though their voices are not elevated to the point where it's actually making a difference. And then there's Jim Wise, and, it's, and it's, the book is called White Like Me, um, which is a play kind of on the book Black Like Me. Right. So then it became, oh, well, is the narrative changing now? Now we have to be concerned about how whites experience racism. And that's the, that's the kind of conversation that I've had when people have talked about this concept of racism working both ways. And I think it does have... It, it, there's meat there, right? There's something there. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that there, once you contextualize it with personal experience for people who are doing the work, there's some animus, right? There's some concern that our voices aren't being heard um, and, and, and we're, not as, we're not as viable. Well, the irony of the, uh, and you make a really good point, the irony of the play on Black Like Me, right, was of course that book was also written by a white man. Right. right. Who became black for the summer of 1959. Right. And one of the things that always struck me about that book, and the reason I thought it would be more helpful and less marginalizing in a way, um, to do the book this way, was that as valuable as John Howard Griffin's book was at the time, and I think it was very important in 1960 and 61 when it came out. Right. But, but I always thought there was this irony, right, that here was a, a white guy who was telling a black story, right? because he became black for the summer, he's telling a black story so right. that white people go, oh my God, it's really hard to be black. <laughs> you know, the point being, there were tons of black writers right. who could have told that story. The equivalent of that story, right. and yet it took this guy to be heard. So what I was thinking was, okay, number one, that's ironic and problematic, but number two, in, in the present day, let's say, you know, at that time, 40 years after Griffin had written, was it really necessary, is, is it good for white folks to keep writing about the black experience when obviously black folks can tell that story and do a much better job of it than we could ever do? Or should we just talk about what it means to be white? Now I realize the, the residual effect, right, of white folks telling that story, of telling the story of what white privilege looks like and how it's experienced and how it might actually be damaging in the long run as well, can have the effect of in a sense, crowding out, right, space in one's brain to take in all the other narratives. That's very possible. I mean, it's possible that someone who reads White Like Me um, maybe now thinks, oh, I understand racism now. I read White right. Like Me, which, of course, would be horrible. But right. I also think it's very possible, and I think more than possible. I think it's probable, and in the 10 years since the book came out, I feel that I have at least some evidence of this, that an awful lot of people who maybe had that book assigned to them in a class. Let's be honest, it didn't become a bestseller. I mean, right. not even close. Right. So the, the people who read it in a classroom, let's say, which is where it got most of the play that it got, usually that was in a class where they were going to then proceed to read five, six, ten other narratives, almost all of them by people of color. And the thinking of the instructors, rightly or wrongly, was that it would be one way of adding to that corpus of work rather than serving as the sole unitary piece of literature. In fact, when I've been contacted by professors who wanted to teach it, sometimes in the early days they would they would contact me and ask about like different ways to teach it. And I would always want to find out like, well, what else are you teaching? You know, I don't want that to be the textbook, you know, about right. race. 
and and luckily no one ever said oh wow that was my plan I was just going to teach you. like they, they all knew they needed to teach other folks right so I mean I think that the the concern is very legitimate because obviously people of color their narratives need to be heard I do think that however there are a lot of people who are more likely to hear those narratives to read those narratives and to become interested in those narratives if they start to think hey, this race issue has something that I need to be thinking about as a white person. Sadly, white folks sometimes just assume we don't have a stake in it, and other than maybe, oh, I'm a good person, and I want to do good things kind of stake, which isn't really helpful. So I realize there's like um, there's an inherent tension whenever yeah. white folks write about our experiences, and I'm quite certain that it could become, you know, I, I know there have been a lot of these white narratives in the last 10 years, and yeah. mine might be one of the first, but it certainly was not the last. And I'm not saying that's a good social trend. I'm not saying, I don't know. Like, I, I know it's complicated, right? But I think that, that this one little piece that white folks, this role that white folks can play, which is, hey, why is this a white issue, um, is, is the role that we can play. It's a very narrow role, in a sense. Um, I wouldn't expect people of color to write about what it means to be white. Um, right. Baldwin actually did it and did it very well, even though he wasn't white. But most people would not want to take the time to do that. And so I feel like if we're going to have a role, that's sort of our role. Okay. So then, so so picking backing off of that, and this is, and I'm bringing up these specific things because when I've talked to people about this, they've kind of these two issues arise, and the first was the the white centric perspective, and yeah. then um, an idea that you introduced in Barack and in between Barack and the Hard Place, which is racism 2.0, right? right? So when I was first introduced to this concept, it was called tokenism to me, right? So it's you know, I have my one black friend who's awesome, all the rest of them, you know, are not. Or I have my one Asian friend, or I have my one Zenith friend, or, have, or whatever it is. Or I know of this one guy I saw on TV who did this. Um, and that's been projected onto me personally, right? So I've had people say, oh, well, you know, this person made it out, so why can't you? Or this person is a lawyer, or this person is on the Supreme Court, so why can't you just go be, you know, that, right? And, um, I think that racism 2.0, right? So when we had our emails, you mentioned yeah. about racism 2.0 kind of being an original um, thought for you, like an original. This is my contribution to something that I put together. But it's one, thing, right, it's one thing I mentioned, right? Yeah. It's it's very similar to me to token, tokenism. So is is there some variation there? Is there something different there that that a nuance or something that we haven't um, fully explored, or or is there some legitimacy in the concern? that it does seem very similar to a concept that we've learned in sociopolitical conversations around race. Well, I think that racism 2.0 owes like all, you know, all intellectual product sort of owes its lineage to prior intellectual product. I think that's pretty standard and that's why, you know, even in that book when I do the racism 2.0 section there's a lot of footnotes. Some right. of them, for instance are footnotes to um, the concept of enlightened racism, which was a book actually by that name by Sut Jolly and Justin Lewis, mm -hmm. and in that book they talked about the way that they, it was actually a book about the Cosby Show and white audience reactions to the Cosby Show and the way that white audiences very much um, had this love of quote unquote um, Cliff and Claire Huxtable mm -hmm. and this belief that the Huxtable family was this great family. Why can't the other black families be like them? Kind of thing. And so they were certainly building on the notion of tokenism. And I was taking that concept of, of enlightened racism and trying to apply it sort of squarely into the political realm where it usually isn't. Even, even the old sort of old school tokenism uh, ideas about what that looks like usually were, I'm not saying always, but usually were the kinds of, uh, they were interpersonal. It was about like, this is my black friend, or this is the black person I hang out with, or this is the Asian woman I dated once, or this is the, the one guy in my department at the office, right? It was much more of an interpersonal, maybe a workplace-oriented kind of thing. What I think we're seeing in the political realm, though, that was a little different, and I'm not saying that this is some genius innovation of mine. It's just that I think what we've noticed in the last few years is that that interpersonal thing that tokenism always was, having that one black friend or that one uh, Latino colleague, is now something which we can apply and are applying to people of color who we don't actually know, whereas tokenism was usually the one you actually knew, you know, and were like neighbors with. 
this is the one who you don't know, but you sort of have this image projected that comports with your larger national image of what America is and what it means to make it in America. And so if it's Cliff Huxtable as a fictional family and Claire Huxtable, that works. If it's Barack and Michelle Obama as a political family, that works. So I'm not suggesting, and at no point would I suggest, that Racism 2.0 was this entirely unique concept. It certainly owes both to the, the arguments about enlightened racism that Jolly and Lewis uh, introduced, who I've you know, obviously mentioned in the book, and these larger concepts of tokenism. But I do think that it is somewhat distinct in the sense that for the first time in the last several years, maybe some of this was going on with Colin Powell before, but I think really it's much more unique in the Obama era, that there has been this tendency for white Americans, an awful lot of us, to say that I like that particular celebrity, that particular, I don't know them, I've never met them, probably never going to meet them, but I, I think that that's someone I can admire, that's someone I can aspire to, and yet I have these larger beliefs, which I'm more than willing to tell pollsters, about the larger black community that I don't like them very much. So I think there are some distinctions, but the only way that one can really, I guess, make up their own mind whether there are would be to read, you know, between Barack and a Hard Place and conclude for themselves either that's just like all old news or maybe it's sort of a combination of old theory and new theory. I don't know. But I mean I think I think it's a slight twist on the concepts of enlightened racism, quote unquote, and tokenism. Right. So 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 understanding those two criticisms, right? So understanding that um, there's concerns about this white centric perspective um, and the idea about kind of ideas that we've learned, but building on them, so not presenting mm -hmm. anything new. And these were two of my criticisms as well, so I'm going to own it. Those were two of my criticisms. Um, let's talk about the idea of being a white ally, right? This whole idea of allyship. Um, I'm going to read a part of your email. So um, there's a point where you said, even in context, I, I mentioned David Leonard in a piece that I wrote on my website. So you said, even David Leonard's account of the concept gives no direction as to how one determines to whom accountability is owed. I think he would agree it's complex. And by the way, what David said about accountability, I agree with entirely. An ally is what you do, not what you say, which is why I have not called myself an anti-racist ally, but an aspiring ally, meaning I aspire to do work that is worthy of that title. But like he said, it is about the work. So my question to you is, how exactly would you define an ally? What does that look like to you in particular? And in terms of the, the, the choices that you've made, I assume that they're all conscious choices. How have those decisions, those choices, contributed to you aspiring to be that definition of an ally? Well, the thing about being an ally is because it is aspirational and it's never fixed, it's never permanent, right? You can be, you can be aspiring. You can always aspire to be an ally seven days a week. And four days of the week, you might actually pull it off, right? And three days, you might not. You might be a hell of an ally on Wednesday in the sense that you did something working in solidarity with folks of color, putting forward a, 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 an article, an essay, an interview, a speech, um, uh, a workshop where you really, you know, are able to click and to mesh with, 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 the, with the larger narrative that is being put forward by people of color. And then there might be another day that you totally fall flat on that. And so I don't think... I don't think an ally is ever this like stop line that a person who aspires to be that. Um, so then, when it comes to my work, right, um, I aspire to be an ally in the way that I frame my arguments about race and about white supremacy. So what that means for me as a writer, let's say first, is that I try to take direction from people of color about what I should be writing about. So whenever I've done a book, right, I mean, I'm, I'm in contact and in communities with folks of color all the time who are giving me feedback about essays, book ideas, um, giving me pushback on things that I've written and saying, hey, you know, this was good, but I'd like you to maybe look at this, or could you think about looking at this? And with White Like Me, for instance, you know, I had a lot of folks, both, both people of color and other white folks who said, you know, that was good, but you didn't do enough about accountability, or you didn't do enough about this or that. And they said, you know, if you have a chance, could you go and redo some of that? And so, you know, me, I, being an aspiring ally, I said, well, sure. I talked to my publisher. We made some changes. I've done that two times now. So that doesn't mean, though, that the work is perfect. There's still problems. There's still issues. There's still conflict, contradictions. Um, but I think that that was an example of me trying to model ally behavior, which is to take very seriously the suggestions of, the criticisms of, the constructive advice 
of people of color and other whites as well about what needed to be in the book in order for it to help their work, right? And the same is true with, with speeches. Like, if I'm giving speeches and, um, and meet, like what I try to do when I go to colleges, for instance, is um, and I'm not able to do it every time, but we try to carve out time like in the afternoon, let's say if I'm speaking in the evening, carve out time in the afternoon for me to sit down with student leaders of color. Occasionally there will be some white allies or aspiring allies there too, but it's usually like the students of color who have either brought me in or, or have collaborated to bring me in. And I sit down with them and we talk about some of the stuff that's going on on the campus, some of the things that they've been organizing around. What are the, And one of the questions that I ask in those settings is, you know, given that I have this microphone tonight and I'm going to have an hour or whatever to talk to your peers and to talk to your colleagues, what do you need me to say? What, what would help you with your peers and colleagues? Because if you had the microphone tonight, in other words, what would you say? I've got it. That's a huge privilege. I want to use the privilege responsibly. What would be helpful to you? And then I get feedback from them about what would be good for their peers to hear so that when they go back into that classroom next week and these issues come up and they bring up an argument, you know, that I will have said something that maybe will resonate and maybe will help them in the classroom. So, you know, that's um, uh, one, just one way that I try to make sure that I'm framing my talk. I'm not just giving the same talk every time. I'm not just working off a set outline, that I'm framing my talk with local um, sort of issues, campus issues in mind and sort of trying to aid and assist in the work that's happening at those schools. Yeah, see, I think that's vital to know. Like, I had no idea you did that. And I think most people don't know you do it. Therefore, the absence of knowledge, they assume that you're not doing it, if that makes sense. Sure. And I'm not saying that I assume that. I'm just saying that that's, you know, human nature. So for me, my question is, um, if you're assigned to be an ally and you're doing this work and you're, you're educating, would you say, based on what you've done so far, right, a lot of your work has been directed primarily at a white audience, educating a white audience about white privilege, about white supremacy, about recognizing racism, and recognizing the contours of race. So then my question for you is, would you say that a primary function of a white ally is not necessarily to work um, directly with people of color in amplifying voices of people of color, but maybe to address people who are in actually racist, right? So people who, white folks who either are colorblind or are racist and don't know exactly what's happening in terms of race dialogue is the goal to educate white? Or is there, is, 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 should white allies be concerned about something else? Well, I think that it's, it's a little of both because clearly there's a danger, right, if all white folks do is operate within white silos where like, oh, I got the white folks. I'm over here. I'm talking to the white folks and y'all do your thing and I'll do. I mean, that's that can't be a permanent condition, right? So one of the things that I talk about when I go to a lot of schools um, and a lot of uh, high schools in particular or middle schools even where I go now, um, there are a lot of those schools are forming affinity groups, right, for, for students of color, uh, for LGBT students, for, for different marginalized populations. And one of the things that I've encouraged them to do is I think they also need to have ally affinity groups, right, where men as men get together and talk about how they're going to fight patriarchy and, and sexist oppression of women, where straight folks and cisgendered folks do the same around sexuality and where white folks do the same around race. But I always caution, right, you don't want the white folks to just have a permanent encampment over there and the straight and cisgendered folks to have their permanent encampment. But that those intra-group dialogues are helpful as a sort of preparatory um, dialogue before the intergroup. Because sometimes what happens, right, we have the intergroup before we're ready. And the white folks come in in the mixed group and say some crazy stuff because we hadn't worked our stuff out. We hadn't talked about it before. And we don't, it's like having a book club meeting where, you know, half the room has read eight pages and the other room half read the whole book and then we're supposed to have a conversation. It doesn't work very well. So sometimes I encourage the white on white stuff. I, I try to work specifically and directly with white folks, but not as a end all be all. It's very much as a first step to this larger step, which is working in community. And, and for me, the other piece of it, right, is when I go to those schools and meet with students of color, that's the part where I'm trying to build with them. Now, when I get up on that stage for a talk, Clearly, I think everyone who brought me knows that the main, the main purpose of it is not necessarily to educate people of color about racism. That's not what they brought the white guy in to do. Right? 
they did bring the white guy in, and when I say they, I mean mostly the you know people of color who typically are the ones who arrange for my speeches because they know that having some white person do that, they don't know, but they suspect that having a white person do that will be helpful to their own ability to organize on the campus. Whether that happens or not, one doesn't always know, but I do hear back from enough of those places to know that in some way it is helping to facilitate that deeper work that the folks who were there when I leave right, still have to do. And so in that sense, it's not solely white silo work. It's, it's aimed at white folks, but the purpose of it is to facilitate the better discussion, whether it's in the class, whether it's in future events or in the community, that will involve everyone. Okay, okay, and 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 I get that, right? So 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 this kind of piggybacks up with something else that was in your email um, that really actually resonated with me, and I think it, it took maybe the second email for me to go. Mm, I kind of I kind of see um, what it is that everyone's missing. Um, I I like to play devil's advocate, but mm -hmm. I think there's still something there. So so you said um, bottom line, I'm trying sometimes succeeding and sometimes failing, to challenge white people. I am doing this in keeping with the direct instruction given by black activists in SNCC, SMCC, um, and for that matter, by Malcolm X as well, to white. Go and work with and on your people. Challenge them because they won't listen to us, and because, frankly, we don't have time to waste on trying to fix white people. That's your job. So, so I found it... Um, Intriguing uh, because I I've never actually met a person who wasn't of color who had even any familiarity with this concept um, and I do find it problematic when people of color in particular say you know white people shouldn't have anything to do with social justice it's it, I don't want to hear what they have to say there's nothing uh, that they can they can provide me I don't agree with that either um, but I think it's a very valid point. Um, and I think that it can be very detrimental to social justice initiatives yeah. when people of color shut out white. I, I think that that's actually harmful, right? So, and I'm, I'm probably not of the Malcolm X crew. I'm more on the MLK side. The um, idea about social justice for the Negro uh, can't thrive in isolation. And I think um, the, the work with white coalition building, the work with um, in the South with not converting people, but kind of making people aware of their own racism and their own white privilege. I think that's all valuable work. Um, and I told you that I would kind of tell you my thoughts on this. So this is the point where I'll just say something to you. Not that it really matters because I'm nobody, <laughs> but I'll tell you. Um, and I think regardless of whom we align with theoretically, um, I think sometimes the work of a white ally straddles the line for a lot of people, right? It's paradoxical more than anything else. And I think it's hard for people in general to unpack that conversation around white allyship, right? It almost seems oxymoronic to a lot of people. Um, and to be an educator, um, I think in some cases, folks are looking to you as a, as a, a benchmark, right? The white ally, right? So they're kind of looking at what you've done so far and what you do and your work and your, your education and what you've provided. And I think that those um, kind of personal attributes are where a lot of the questions about the role a white ally plays in social justice arise, right? The one criticism that I had was about the lack of graduate work. And some people have looked at me and said, oh, well, you don't have to have a graduate degree, blah, blah, blah. And that's not what I'm saying. So I'm not going to go down the whole, you know, you have to have an education because it doesn't blank, blank, blank. I'm specifically talking about graduate work, not the degree, but the research, right? So what most folks don't realize is that in grad school, you do a lot of research. You write a dissertation. Um, you write several pieces of papers in most cases. And those can contribute heavily to the academic knowledge and the breadth of conversation that happens in your specific field. Right. And so my concern about you was, that there wasn't the graduate level work um, and that in some cases there are people of color who feel, okay, well, I have PhDs and JDs, I've done all this graduate level work, and I'm saying the exact same thing, right? I'm saying the same thing, um, but because of the color of my skin, I'm not able to um, kind of do the converting, do the educating, do the reaching out. and and. 
I mean, how do you how do you contend with contend with that paradox? With that, it, it's a quandary. And so my well, question is, how do you how do you manage that conversation? Well, I think there are a couple of issues, right? One is that. Um, it's certainly true that the research burden of a graduate student, particularly a PhD student, is heavy. I mean, if you're going to do a dissertation, right, you're supposed to do a lit review that basically would encompass pretty much everything in your field. Now, obviously, I'm sure most dissertations and most dissertation writers haven't actually read every single thing that's been written, in, but they do a pretty good job by narrowing down their topic to getting everything in that sub, you know, subtopic. Um, but, you know, the interesting thing is when you write books, not white like me, which is a memoir, but like when I wrote Colorblind, uh, for instance, I had to do a pretty exhaustive lit review even to write the book proposal to say what I was going to do differently from existing books, what the existing literature out there on that type of subject was that was similar. Um, so whether it was quite as exhaustive, I mean, I didn't obviously have to do the, the fine parsing of every academic journal article written about colorblind racism in the last 20 years. But, you know, it's a pretty ex extensive and exhaustive lit review that I had to do for that as well. Um, that said, it isn't clearly going to be the same level of exhaustive uh, uh, research burden, perhaps, that a PhD student has. And so I, re I realized the, you know, sort of the unfairness of, of that research burden relative to what, I guess, you know, for lack of a better term, what popular educators, right, if, if, if that's what those of us in the public realm would be, right, sort of popular educators or public educators, um, it's, a different, it's a different burden for sure. Um, but I do think there's also another issue that, that is inherently unfair to those in the academy, and especially if they're folks of color, and especially if they're women of color, but anyone in the academy, unfortunately, it's a very different type of work whether it's the written or the speaking part, than what public educators do, right? So those who are in the academy usually are reading and writing academic journal work that isn't seen by the public. You know, they're writing books mostly with academic publishers that is not mass marketed for a general public. And those who go into the public realm, we're writing with commercial publishers, albeit mine is, you know, mine have always been very small publishers and deliberately progressive, but nonetheless commercial and broad audience or we're giving speeches you know, in the public domain. And so by definition, those of us who go that route, we do come to attention more frequently. Or academics who go that route also, right? So there are a lot of academics, including academics of color, who have sort of carved out that space, right, as public intellectuals. So whether we're talking about someone like Michelle Alexander, you know, with her, with her law background, um, or whether we're talking about someone like Cornell West or Michael Eric Dyson or Melissa Harris Perry, who have done academic work, but nobody knows their academic work. Like nobody really, you know, read Cornell West academic work outside of the academy until he had the big reader, you know, that compiled it all or whatever. It's his, it's his public intellectual work that made him really well known. And I mean, on the one hand, that's a, I don't know if it's a slap in the face to the academy, but it certainly got him a lot of attention that the academic work didn't. And I'm sure that if I had gone the academic route, um, I probably would have still written books, maybe, about this topic as a professor or something, but I'm sure they wouldn't have gotten the same attention, I have no doubt, because they would have been written for a very different audience. So um, I think part of it is absolutely about white privilege and male privilege and the combination of those, and part of it is the nature of the PhD work, because when you get a PhD, typically you're going to become a professor, and unfortunately, probably 95% of the professors or more out there don't really become public figures. Maybe they should, you know, and, and the, the best that I know to do is to make sure that I'm holding up some of that academic work so that people who maybe otherwise wouldn't be exposed to it can be. So if I'm citing that work, if I'm, re, if I'm, if I'm looking at that research and making sure that I can popularize some of that research, so Diva Pager, who's a sociologist, right, has done this amazing work on job discrimination or um, uh, Bertrand and Mullenathan that did the work on the black names, white names, and, and job discrimination. That stuff got a little bit of media attention, but mostly it was written, you know, in academic, legalese kind of language. And I'm, some of us who talk about that stuff publicly, trying to bring attention to that really important work, the irony being, then we'll get noted for bringing it up, even though it was their work. I mean, I, I don't know how to resolve the quandary except to say, I know it's there, and I think we have to have some like uneasy alliance between academics and, and public educators, right? Like they do that really good work and we try to break it down for average everyday folks and hopefully support each other. You know? so, so then my question to you is I know that, um, I mean, audiences are changing, right? So a lot of conversations about race have moved to social media. A lot of conversations about race have moved online. 
not just to social media, not just to YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, but also they've moved to online publications. You know, Salon, uh, The Nation, Atlantic, major articles, major conversations right now um, about about race. And and I've wondered this about you um, that most of your work is either on your website or it's in your books, right? So if I want to find out what Tim Wise is thinking about. Richard Sherman. I want to find out what Tim Wise is thinking about, you know, issues of colorism or whatever it is. I have to go seek out Tim Wise at timwise.org, right? I have to go read the books, right? And my question is, if we're really, if, if if your goal is really to kind of reach a broader audience and to be kind of like the gateway, right, the gateway conversation about race, um, why isn't there more of an effort to meet people where they are, right? Why isn't there more? Why am I not seeing um, work from you on the route. Why am I not seeing work from you on salon? Why why am I not seeing you having these conversations in a very public way that reaches these these audiences, um, kind of where they where they already are? Well, I have I have had pieces on the route before, probably three or four over the last several years. Uh, I think the most recent was probably after the Zimmerman verdict uh, last summer, and and I was approached to do that. Um, I've never been approached by Salon. I've never been approached. The only time the nation, I sent the nation something years ago, and they paid me a kill fee not to run it. So that lets you know what they do in my writing, right? Um, so to be honest, though, the, the real reason I don't do that, I used to write pieces and send them to a couple of online public publications. I used to send to Alternet. I used to send to Z Magazine. I used to send to Black Commentator. I used to send to uh, Black Agenda Report before I had my little tiff with, with Bruce um, last year. Um, but, uh, and, and, and it's not that I, or counterpunch a few others. I used to do that. And one of the reasons that I stopped, um, to be honest with you, and it may have been, maybe it's not what I needed to do. Maybe it wasn't the right move, but my thinking was that if I've already got a, a web space, my own you know, blog, and I also tweet out that stuff or put it on Facebook or, you know, put it on social media, I sort of felt like to take up, like if I send an article to the nation or if I send an article to Alternate, and they publish it, which maybe they would do now because of the level of name recognition or something. I don't know. Um, I, I honestly, I feel like that's taking away space that could be given to somebody else who would write about race. So in a way, right, it's a catch-22 because for people who are tired of hearing my name or tired of seeing my stuff in print or tired of me crowding out the voices of other people, and, I, and, I, and I'm not making fun of that concern. Like, that's a legit concern, right? But if that is a concern and then I write for Salon or I write right. for Play or I write for, for Alternet, then people are going to go, well, there's another Tim Wise article. You know, so right. I felt like I kept it all on my site. I cannot be accused of, of taking bandwidth you know, from other people's uh, web pages. But I do think um, I need to get a lot more adept at other ways of, of getting stuff out there. You know, I, 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 like I said, I do put some stuff when I write something, I put it out on social media. If I have uh, an interview or something, I may put that out on social media. But I generally don't want to take that space away um, from other writers. There are too many good writers out there. There are too many good thinkers out there who write about race, and they're getting their stuff, and I'm glad that they're getting their stuff on, on Alternet, and they're getting their stuff on uh, Black Agenda Report and Black Commentator and, and Counterpunch even increasingly, or or uh, or Salon. You know, for years, Salon didn't talk very much about race, and frankly, the nation didn't either. I mean, for years, Patricia Williams was the only one that they ever had articles from on race at the nation, and now they're doing a lot better, and I'm glad. I don't feel that I need to hone in on that. Um, I feel like I can put my stuff out there and be one voice among many, but but if people feel that it would be good to interact on those platforms, I'm down to do it. I just honestly was removing myself from it consciously to sort of not pick up too much air, you know? Right. And, so, and, and, and I didn't know that you had pieces on the roof, so I'm going to go look them up now. I had no idea. Uh, but but uh, I think for me, I'm thinking I'm not seeing that. I don't think that you have to exist in the silo, right? So I don't think that because you are writing on Salon, you have to write by yourself. Like I, I would love to see you write with Brittany Cooper. I don't think that if you're writing um, on The Nation, you have to write by yourself. Why not write with Michael Denzel Smith, right? So I think that that's one of those optical, and it seems kind of cheesy and like surface, but optically, I think that that changes a narrative that happens about white allyship, right? I think a lot of times white allyship exists 
kind of like, and excuse my term, but like, you know, Captain save a hoe right? So like, I got to go help these black people. I got to go get, you know, they're all downtrodden. I have to go with my cape and the S on my chest, and I have to go and fix black people. I have to go fix people of color. I have to go fix Latinos. Have, you know, I, and I think that if there is an optical representation of you with other people of color, maybe in an op-ed or in an interview that is on a mass um publicized social media based online um, publication that changes the narrative and, I, and, I, and I'm only saying that because I think um, like I said the absence of of knowledge in certain conversations the absence of understanding and the ignorance always it, it becomes a binary right so it becomes a he's not doing this because I don't see it and right. and I think that's that's where I think white allyship dies, right? That's where, it, that's where it fails because there is this kind of eggshell relationship. There is this um, I, I, walking on nails, walking on ice. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, should I publish here? Should I talk to this person? And I think that's when um, it becomes dangerous both for people of color who are looking and sometimes reaching out and wanting to see these things happen and also for whites who would like to be more active and who fight for social justice who don't necessarily know how to navigate um, sort of treacherous conversations, right? I mean, it, it, I think that's the danger of how, how, to, um, how to marry the two, right? The intention with the, with the implementation. Right. I, think no, that's I, I, I much like the idea of, of collaborating on written pieces, and, I, and I've uh, done a few of those historically, but it's been a while, and I'd be very happy to do um, more, and you know, haven't really thought a lot about what that might look like in, in the last couple of years, but um, I would be very open to that. I've done a lot of, um, obviously, dialogues on various campuses and various places with folks of color where it's myself and one, two, three, or four other people. We do that a lot as public events. I haven't done it so much in the written form, um, so I mean, I would, love, I would love to do that because I think certainly from, from, from what I gather when I've done those in public forums, I find those to be, I think, the most rewarding intellectually, um, the most rewarding events because, you know, if I have something valuable to say, that's great. If the other person or people have valuable things to say, then we bounce off of one another and, and gets a lot better fermented ideas. So I love, I love that idea um, for the written form. It's not always as, as easy to do in the written form as it is in a, in a, you know, in a public dialogue. But I think and one of the things you bring up I think is, is very important, and it's um, – something that all of us need to remember when we're criticizing others, not just people criticizing me. I need to remember it too when I criticize others. And that is that what we see of others is only that part, and it's a very small part, right, that actually seeps out into the public, right? So people who criticize me overwhelmingly, we don't really know one another. Mm -hmm. And who I've criticized, I don't really know them that well either. Like, I've mm -hmm. never sat down with them, had a cup of coffee, had a glass of wine, had dinner, and, like, talked about life and our kids, if we have kids, and, like, what our aspirations are and who we are. But all we see is the public persona. Mm -hmm. And I think any of us um, who write or who speak or who have any type of public image or persona know that there's a lot of different layers to who we are and the layer that we let people see when we're on the stage giving a talk is like way different than when even just when you and I are talking now or if I was just hanging out with friends in the living room, right? And I think we need to remember that all of us who come to this work bring a lot of baggage that's good and bad into the room and that sometimes we're going to be really on point and other times we're going to sort of, you know, screw up, and, and that unless we know the full sort of background of, of each other's travel to this to this place where we are, the odds are pretty good we're going to, like you said, act on the basis of incomplete information or, or the absence of information so that we assume something about someone because we didn't see them handle their business this particular way, so we assume they didn't. Or, right. you know, or in my case, I mean, I've, I've had a lot of folks who, you know, sort of in, in the last six or seven months have suggested that, you know, like, for instance, that I just sort of came out of nowhere and my career took off and, and why is that when, in fact, and I'm not denying the privilege and advantages that I've had in this work, I've talked about it forever, but, but the reality is for like the first 11 or 12 years, 
that I was doing this work, I promise you, nobody knew who I was, and I was perfectly okay with that because I didn't get into it to get well known. I didn't get into it to make friends. You know, I didn't get into it for that purpose. But people didn't see that, right? If you didn't see the guy speaking to five people in the basement of the University of West Alabama, and three of them were playing pool in 19. <laughs> Like if you didn't see that, but all you saw was the guy being interviewed on CNN, right? It's really easy to go, oh yeah, that's that guy that everybody always listens to. Well, you know, I get that, but there's a lot that came before, and that's true of everyone I've ever criticized to, right? right. Everyone I've talked bad about, they've got stuff that I didn't see, they've done work that I don't know about, and I just maybe part of this work for all of us is we have to we have to learn to really care about and be compassionate toward one another for all the crap that every one of us deals with just in life, let alone in this work, which we all know is really difficult work to do. Right. So I'm, I'm wrapping it up, but I think that's actually very important what you said just now because I think um, that conversation about compassion and understanding that there's more below the surface is even more relevant when it comes to the idea of white allyship, right? So we know that there is a distrust of whites when it comes to people of color. Um, for the most part, um, groups of color have had, you know, issues in communities, whether it's segregation, whether it's outright discrimination, whether it's mass incarceration, whatever it is. There are issues with um, whites, especially white males. And there is a constant threat of, is this person someone I can trust? Is this notion of white allyship just another way to gain the system so that I'm less marginalized or that something negative will impart in my life? And, and raise up this person who's now saying that they're my ally. And I think um, that's, that's a, a very treacherous, again, another, another conversation that's very difficult to navigate because um, there's just so much history there that none of us really have any direct relationship to today. It's just the history and the, the makeup of, of, you know, life as it is now, right? So um, I, I definitely agree that there's a lot more, a lot more there. So, so this is my last question for you. But, um, and we had emailed back and forth about co-authorship, but I think we kind of talked about that just now with the whole um, idea of doing alpha ads and stuff like that. Um, and, I, and to answer, you had a question for me in your email if I thought it was necessary to co-author books with people who are doing this work, and I don't. I don't think it's necessary to co-author. Um, again, I think it's an optical sign um, to, because optics are very important, perception is very important. Um, but I do think that that, that would be a, a, an indicator to people who um, are wary of white allyship in general. Um, I think it would be good for that specific group. But I think there are other ways to kind of work with people who are doing this work um, out in the public. I think there's lots of different ways. I mean, I think there's talks that you can do, panels, um, which was actually one of the very early ones I was introduced to you. I watched a panel of yours on YouTube. And you were the only person who wasn't of color. <laughs> so that was like, oh, okay, that's great. So, and I think there is that, you know, the fix of kinship of, you know, people in my social group are endorsing this person. Um, people are saying that this is okay, so I'm more likely to be okay with it as well. Um, but I think that there's lots of different methods. Um, my last criticism um, about you was kind of um, about kind of operating like in a silo, right? So. Um, I was concerned about uh, this idea that um, a lot of your work, yes, has been with people in the color, of color, but it's kind of in the background, right? So, so we don't necessarily see it, but but it's there, right? Um, and then when when there are conversations about people of color who who um, you know personally, and you said this in your email, you talked about. Um, some folks who, who criticized you, and you said, you know, these prominent scholars, and I won't go through the whole list, but you said these prominent scholars and these folks have kind of said, yeah, he's great. Why would these other people, you know, say, no, I'm not into him? And, and you asked what, what my reason was. And I think there's two things there. The first is that um, I think that's a dangerous argument, right? I think it's dangerous to say, you know, these people of color endorse me, these people of color like me, and you don't, what's wrong with you, right? Because then it almost subjects the, the black monolith, right? Like, oh, well, this black person says I'm great, you know, why don't you? And, 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 and that, I, I mean, it, I think it's dangerous for that reason alone, right? The idea that, you know, we're not a monolith and because I have my own thought, right? I think therefore I am, so I yeah. think that there's issues here, right? right. Um, so there's, there's that reason. But I also think that when that conversation is brought up, it almost is like a silencing tool, right? It's like, 
you know, and I'm saying this because I, after I wrote the piece, the second piece about our conversation, um, I had someone who basically told me for about a week and a half, um, and it kept coming back to, you know, these other people are so much more important than you. Why do you think that your opinion counts? And my argument was simply, you know, I don't have to think anything about my opinion, right? It does count, right? Because I am in this conversation. I am I'm in the work of social justice. Right. And whether someone who is more important than me agrees with me or not is completely irrelevant. And seeking to silence me by saying these people matter more is dangerous. And so my question is to you, what when you bring up those names, right? When you bring up the conversation about people of color in particular, what is your goal? Because I think it translates negatively. I, let me clarify it very, very, very clearly. Um, it's not, and I even said in the email that I wasn't suggesting that these people were more vital or more important. But the question that I asked you was, I, I think it must mean something, and I don't know for sure what it means. I actually came up with a fourth possibility since the email. I've given you three, but I think it must mean something. If if people like Angela Davis, Michelle Alexander, Kim Crenshaw, and all the others that I mentioned have generally, and I'm not saying that they, and they didn't say, oh, he's great, we love him. They just have said nice things about my work, or we've worked together. I've had, you know, public dialogues with Angela. I've had a public dialogue with Michelle. I've had uh, a public dialogue with Imani Perry at Princeton last month. So it must mean something that this litany of of scholars, public intellectuals, and activists of some prominence have all generally said, you know, we're glad he's doing what he's doing. He's doing good work. And and I wanted to know what it might mean that they have said that and that the people who have been most harsh, I'm not talking about, like your criticism I thought was, even though I disagreed with parts of it, it wasn't hateful. I mean, I didn't, I didn't read it as, as angry at me or, or disrespectful at all. But there have been some that I think have been entirely that. And there have been right. some that have been rooted in outright lies right. about who I am and what I do. And the individuals who have launched those, I don't think that they have nothing to offer. I don't think that they're not important thinkers, but I think that they are pretty obviously, you know, objectively speaking, less prominent at this stage in their careers than those others. And my question was, what is it that they know that the established scholars don't? Because if all of these folks have actually worked with me, like we've met, we've worked together, we've talked about these issues, and they seem to think, yeah, he's actually pretty real and we're glad he's doing it. And these other people who don't know me but think they do, um, who make up things about me having a minimum speaking fee that is not accurate, um, but they tweet that out and their 23,000 followers believe them. Um, yeah. And, you know, when that happens, um, why are they doing that? And, and the only reasons that I can figure are that either, you know, Angela Davis is, is a punk. I don't think accurate, right? Or Michelle yeah. Alexander is a fool, and they and I can snow them because I'm just so so crafty. Or and maybe these other people know the world better than they do. Or maybe the argument could be made that because they're prominent, they're sort of sold out, and they're not really about social change. That too seems silly to me, but you know, whatever. And the only other option, and I did not mean it disrespectfully, but the other option to me was that precisely because. Other people feel their voices aren't being heard. Like Angela Davis knows she gets heard, right? Michelle right. Alexander's book was a bestseller. They're not worried about me or any white ally, quote unquote, crowding their voice out. They know full well they're going to get their voice heard. But if I'm a person of color with a lot of important things to say, and for whatever reason, I don't feel I'm being heard as much as I should be, it's really sort of easy, I think, to point at me and go, oh, yeah, maybe you're the reason. You know, one of the things I didn't mention in the email, but I've mentioned in previous discussions about this, was like if you made a list of the 20 or 30 most, I don't know, prominent, and, and by that I mean media profile people in the country who talk, write, and speak about race, I would probably be one of the only white people on that list, mm -hmm. um, the only white person on that list. And I'm not saying that's bad. That That's fine. But the thing is, if, if just mathematically, I can't be the reason that a certain individual's not on that list because I'm one of the 20 or I'm one of the 30. And I think that Angela Davis, Michelle Alexander, Kim Crenshaw, Mike Dyson, these folks sort of, you know, we all have ego needs. Their ego needs are met. My ego needs are being met. But if I wasn't having my ego needs met, which quite a while ago I was not, and I mentioned to you in the email, I did this really ugly thing where I lashed out at Morris D's in a really public way and attack the Southern Poverty Law Center in a really public way. That doesn't mean there isn't a legitimate critique of the center and Morris Deeds. There is, and I still have some of that critique in my belief system, but I did it in such an ugly, 
way that was really about me. It wasn't about Morris Dees. It wasn't about the Southern Poverty Law Center. And so I just think some of that, particularly the lies, particularly when you say things about someone that's demonstrably untrue and you didn't even think to check them out or research them, I have to think that's about you, not me. I, I and I would actually agree, but I would put forth as my suggestion that that the actual reason is just it's Occam's razor, right? It's the simplest answer, which is uh, they just don't really know what they're talking about in some cases, right? So we've kind of alluded to this in in this conversation, but it's the absence, right? It's the absence of knowledge around um, because they haven't talked to you and they haven't interviewed you, and a lot of the times they haven't read your books, right? So I'm coming at it from a very different perspective, which is that um, I have no vested interest, right? So I, I came into social justice after getting an engineering degree. I haven't been doing this for, you know, however long, um, and I read your books, and I found them intriguing, but I had questions, right? So, the, the, so my questions and critiques were secondary to my knowledge of what you had already done, yeah. and I think in some cases it's just it's as simple as, um, someone says something to these people or they had a conversation and maybe they know very little and they're seeing you know one third of the total picture and with that they're running with this conversation right. and, and I think that I do think that some of their critiques are valid those are the ones that I brought up or the whole idea about white centric conversations around race um, about kind of recycling ideas that we've already kind of talked about I think that those concerns are valid um, only because it, it makes people of color feel up appropriated and it makes the conversation to some feel hijacked. So I think that that's dangerous, right? But I think in terms of the ad hominem conversations, right, so the, the personal attacks and all this stuff is, not, is, is, is frankly useless and it doesn't, it doesn't further the conversation. So I, I, I wanted to talk to you specifically about that because I did, that did, that was probably the only thing in your email that rubbed me the wrong way because it felt like a silencing tool, right? So I'm not saying that's the intent. But I do think that it comes. It sometimes comes across as a silencing mechanism, saying, "You know, I'm valid. These folks say so, and the fact that you disagree doesn't mean much because you're not these folks." And and and, and that's something I've actually heard from others as well. So so I mean, I wanted to voice it to you so that right. you understood that. Um, I appreciate it. And here's the only thing I can think to ask back. Like I mean, I know that. I know that my understanding is that it has also been referred to by some as, you know, a little more than name dropping on my part. Yeah. Fine. I know that's what Sui thinks and there are others who feel that way. But at the same time, I also, I, I think we want to be real here, right? That, that I mean, if, 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 if Angela Davis says something nice about your work, right? Right? I mean, like if, if tomorrow she calls you up and she yeah. should, if you do yeah. good work, like I, it would be great. But like if she did that or if, or if Michelle Alexander or Kim Crenshaw got in touch with Sui and some of the people who critique me in a lot more harsh terms than you have, I doubt that they would hold back that fact and not tell anyone out of fear that somebody might think they were name dropping, right? It's yeah. not, I, I'm not trying to use it as a sort of ultimate trump card because you know what? They could all be wrong. I mean, I mean, and because, you know, I could still be the person that these critics say I am, even though they're working with incomplete information because Angela Davis is working with incomplete information too. She only knows what she knows from us working together and what she's read. So right. it's really about who's right and who's wrong. It's about saying that the fact that there are, you know, the fact that there are some pretty well-established, well-respected folks who seem to think that on balance this is valid work that, that white allies do or aspiring allies do and that Tim Wise in particular is doing doesn't necessarily mean that I'm right and these other folks are wrong. But it has to mean something in the larger frame of things. And I think that there are a lot of people, part of the incomplete information that they, the information they don't have is they don't realize that I've done those public dialogues, for instance. I mean, I've had people say, why don't you ever appear with women of color? Well, I should do more of that, but I've done, you know, in the last couple of years, those dialogues with Michelle and with Angela Davis and Imani Perry and Eva Jefferson Patterson, but people don't know any of that. And then when they hear that, they're like, oh, well, okay. You know? And so I guess really what we're talking about at some level is when people have incomplete information about each other, which is all the case, right? Um, we have to figure out a way to meet each other halfway so that I make that information maybe more obvious by, by maybe collaborating with people as you were talking about and taking certain steps to, to be less in a silo. That's my piece of it. That's the part that I can do. And then the research burden of critics, right, is... Right 
actually read the work, familiarize themselves with what the person has done right. and haven't done. You have done that research. That's, you know, you've read the books, you're familiar with it. That's not something that all those critics have done. And I feel like I'm willing to come halfway out of that silo and really, you know, make it clear what the intentionality is as long as other folks are willing to sort of also dig a little deeper and find out what it is I've actually said or done versus maybe their caricature of it. Yeah. Right, and I think, and in, in to, to pivot it off of a Tim Wise conversation and onto the idea of white allyship, I think the reason why that happened specifically to you is because of this whole narrative of a white ally. There is a, a blanketed distrust. So even, um, even though it sounds logical, do the research, read the book, check online before you make these comments, um, it's much easier to make those assumptions about someone or something or a, con a conversation that there's already a running narrative of this check. And that's what I think is the, the, the conversation around white, white allyship that we have to really talk about is the distrust, right? That's well, the real issue. And I think the research is what you do because you distrust. I think well, if you distrust some it, people, some people, yes. Ideally, right? I mean, if you do, I, look, I, let me be really clear. I don't think, and I've said this many, many times, I don't think people of color should just trust any white ally, quote unquote, including me. I don't think that you should just, I don't think women should just trust men when it comes to patriarchy and sexism. I, I think that marginalized peoples have to figure out ways to protect themselves from marginalization. And if in a given moment, working with a white ally or for a woman working with male allies makes sense and, and seems safe and valid, then by all means do that. And if in a certain moment it doesn't, then don't. You know, after after some of the critiques that have come out, folks would say, I don't want Tim Wise as my ally, and, and that's fine. Like, if someone doesn't want to work with me, they don't have to work with me. We're, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. I'm going to try to do it better, but I think that, that I wouldn't want people to just take my word for anything. That's why I call myself an aspiring ally, not an ally in the finished sense. By all means, check, check out what someone is doing. Don't just assume that they're for real. Like I think the research that I'm asking people to do is precisely because I don't want them to just take it on faith that I'm that I'm doing good work, you know? Right, right. And I think I mean I'm gonna end the interview there, but I think this is a very important conversation. Um, and I think it's a conversation that probably should happen more frequently. Not just specifically with you, but but when we talk about navigating race, especially since now I feel like now in the last five to eight years, um, conversations about coalition building and allyship have have reached a, a fever pitch. I, I, I feel like it's, it's um, probably is one of the most important conversations right now um, that we can have in terms of moving past this conversation. Right. So I always joke that I'm in social justice, but I would love to be John. Yeah. You just froze up on me, I think. Because justice was just, you know, our daily norm, right? Um, but until we get there, I think this conversation will need to continue to be. It's an iterative process. It will continue to need to be had. Um, until we actually uh, progress. So I have nothing else for you today, but I do want to thank you, um, thank you for interviewing with me twice in 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 a month. I feel um, you know totally awesome about that. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just glad I got the technology to work today because I couldn't me make it. Too. <laughs> feeling, feeling really uh, like 20 years younger than I am <laughs> to be able to really make technology work the way it's supposed to. So. Well, I want you to have a great day, sir. Um, and uh, you know, I'll I'll obviously keep in touch with you, and I want to thank you again. So um, I thank think you. all my viewers are really happy this happened. So I'm glad we got some questions answered. Sounds good. Take care. Right. Thanks. Alrighty, bye. Bye. How do I?